Nigeria and um, good day to all our participants from around the world. My name is Charles Ugele um, and I'm the Chief Representative and Advisor West Africa of GDP Global Development, a UK-based firm. For this webinar uh, today, which is the second in the series, we are going to be talking about uh, the global trade and foreign direct investment trends, the sector prospects, disruptive technologies, the fourth industrial revolution and impact on business and industries. It's going to be discussed here. Special Nigerian special economic zones. Hmm. That area that is a big focus in Nigeria and Nigeria is thriving very well in. We're going to dive into that. Then, of course, we're going to look at investment promotion and special economic zones. How is the federal government collaborating with the states? Then we'll do question and answers, and then we will um, you know, take your views as participants, and then we'll move on from there. Part of the questions we're going to be asking and answering with the presentations today will be one, how can the Nigerian states follow international best practices to attract new investment opportunities? And how should the special economic zones in Nigeria focus on investment opportunities that can be attracted in the next 12 months, to the next two years? Those issues and questions and discussions will be heard here just now. Uh, without much ado, uh, dear participants, please welcome John Hanna, is the Founder and Managing Director of GDP Global Development, UK Limited. John, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining this webinar, the second in the series of webinars focusing on Nigeria and West Africa for trade and investment prospects. So I, I would like to just set the scene a little bit uh, based on some of our understanding of what's happening in in global trade and to some extent FDI. I uh, want to look at SEZ trends, uh, which are obviously very important to the future infrastructural economy of Nigeria. Uh, I want to share with you some best practices and also focus in on some of the challenges for SEZ developers in particular, trying to determine what is coming in terms of investment opportunities as the pace of development now post COVID is only going to accelerate as manufacturers and uh, service businesses move towards a more uh, digital economy using the latest disruptive technologies. So much of our information on this comes from our uh, consulting and benchmarking work, as Charles in indicated, and also in our training and e-learning capabilities over the last 20 years. So I'm going to share with you some of the insights that we have drawn, and uh, I hope it will set the scene for the bigger discussions that we're going to have uh, with our, our guests and experts from, from Nigeria. So the first thing we should think about is when, when we're looking at SEZs uh, and uh, economic prospects for Nigeria and, uh, and West Africa is, of course, the potential that foreign direct investment can offer to support the economy and help it grow alongside local business development. And when we look at the World Bank's Global Investment Competitiveness Report, these are the key criteria that investors are looking for. So obviously, physical infrastructure, you can see, is right there. It's important. It's about 70% of the criteria for being important, whether it's critical or, or substantially important. But even higher than that is political stability and security and very clear legal regulatory environment, a sort of clean uh, place to do business without surprises. Also large market size. Well, Nigeria has that. Not only is Nigeria a very substantial market, uh, the biggest in, in Africa with 200 million or more inhabitants, but it's also coming right at this time now when movements in the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement 
customs modernizations, investment facilitation, and other global trade, world trade initiatives are coming together, hopefully, to bring Africa to the world. Macroeconomic stability is an important criterion. Actually, this, of course, right now is a challenge for all economies. I haven't yet found an economy in the last few months that has that macroeconomic stability. And the next criterion listed is talent and labor. And that is very much important. It's, it's a challenge for developing countries to turn on the talent and the skills, but with good collaborations at all levels, national, state level, local, and with the private sector and the tertiary sector, educational sector, there is always a good chance to put together a talent program that will um, attract uh, and incentivize investors to locate. Whilst locations are important, it's true to say that with globalization now and the ability to invest anywhere on the planet, the investor has so many choices to turn to compared with, say, 10, 10, 15, 20 years ago. So it's not just about the basic rules and regulations. It's actually about the, the way things work in practice. An investor has so many choices, especially those multinationals that are going to feature in terms of global value chain um, adjustments for the coming years. So they are looking for basically a very friendly and flexible business environment with, as I said earlier, access to markets, access to skills, and a very good ICT infrastructure. And when we look at Nigeria, Nigeria has, I think some of the continents, if not some of the world's best ICT infrastructure, we're using it now. It works pretty well. Other parts of the physical infrastructure are, of course, the challenge. And that's really why SEZs do have an important role to play. The next item I should just really refer to is that we are living, of course, in a rapidly changing global economy. We know that it's only been accelerated in the last seven or eight months. But before that, and even now in the next 10 years, the pace of change in technology, in a global trade, in a consumer demand is only going to increase. The economies have to grow fast. In Africa, they have slowed down. In Nigeria, probably one of the worst affected uh, GDP uh, growth rates in the last few years. But with stability and uh, new economic stimulus and new infrastructure, economic environment can improve and, and help to create a rapid uh, economic growth in Nigeria. Of course, at, at local level, Nigeria is changing all the time with the private sector initiating so much uh, change and development across all of the industry sectors. Also, foreign direct investment is, is changing, and it's tied in closely, as I mentioned earlier, with global value chains. And we know, uh, anyone who has studied the last few months, we know that multinationals, many of them who have maybe put too many of their eggs in the Asian manufacturing uh, basket are now going to have to review how they place their investment, uh, foreign investment this, uh, locations for uh, manufacturing, for assembly, for logistics, for, even for design and R&D. And much of that investment has a chance to get closer to customers in Africa and maybe also to other parts of the world as well. Of course, Asia will still be the main manufacturing hub for the coming years, but there is an opportunity for Nigeria and West Africa to do well. Um, when we take a look at SEZs, well, it doesn't uh, take uh, too much knowledge to know that this has been a major trend in infrastructure investment over the last 20, 25 years, especially in line with globalization and investment opportunities in developing countries. So right now, today, Dantad is informing us, and I know most of the free zones and uh, world trade organizations, uh, economic zones, promoters, indicate that there are at least 5,000 SEZs officially registered and maybe in operation right now. That's a big increase over the last five to seven years. And there are still also at least 500 more economic zones scheduled and slated to come on board probably the next five to seven years. But on the downside, not all SEZs are successful, quite the contrary. Only a handful of all the SEZs that are uh, available for investors right now have really focused in and obtained any level of success. Many SEZs remain only uh, uh, sort of on paper. Many SEZs 
have stalled once they have launched, and therefore their, their economic zones are, are not fully utilized. And it's also true to say that many SEZs in all parts of the world, but especially developing countries, they have not really delivered on the idea of spillover effects. This is a, the economic term to describe benefiting from the, the skills, the value chain opportunities that uh, foreign investment can provide. So we will hear today from experts in Nigeria's SEZ activities. We'll hear how these challenges are going to be met and are being met at the moment. The SEZs, of course, are attractive. They're easy or they seem to be relatively easy to establish. They provide a high level of physical infrastructure and maybe also some regulatory advantages as well, including the, the standard uh, fiscal advantages of tax and duty free uh, for imports and for exports. They have got their advantages, but it also has to be said, it's a balancing act for a national economy. And even at the state level, it can be a balancing act. You have to be, I think, mindful of the incentives that you give away in terms of free infrastructure, maybe other forms of uh, incentives to foreign investors against the, the tax uh, return or even the uh, employment return. Again, not all SEZs are going to hire thousands and thousands of employees. Many uh, uh, manufacturers will be using advanced technologies, very efficient to automate production processes. So they will create certainly high-skilled, high sustainable jobs for the long term, but they won't necessarily be the answer to mass uh, levels of uh, job creation that are needed. The way forward for SEZs, and I'll give you my global view and that of my colleagues, as we have worked in benchmarking more than, I think, 300 SEZs in the Middle East, uh, Asia, and Africa over the last five years. I think that one of the most important requirements is to determine the strategic focus of any SEZ, simply to produce SEZs in a state economy or um, a national economy is not going to necessarily be successful. There has to be some kind of strategic insight to what is happening. Certainly, there's also a need to look at the value proposition that the SEZ is going to present to the world. Again, I've seen in, in quite a lot of countries in, in Africa and elsewhere that SEZs are, are not clearly defined. I think the promoters and investors I'm not quite sure which way to go with their SEZ investments. So they're trying to be jack of all trades. Whereas uh, those that have had success in recent times have done that strategic uh, development and have focused in on particular business needs and have provided infrastructure and clustering environment for, for those industry sectors. So we think that when, uh, when going about SEZ development, uh, there are these four steps, you can see them. I know from my own experience in, in actually developing SEZs in the UK, going back quite a few years ago, I have to say it didn't always follow. I think sometimes the third step, international comparative analysis, was often given a, an easy ride because the political will, the passion, the champions locally were so strong. And of course, you need those, those uh, motivated people and stakeholders that they were turning a blind eye to the, what the global economy um, is offering. And I, I strongly encourage any SEZ promoters these days to really try and make sure they do the homework so they have as best as possible a good chance for developing successful SEZs. When we look at SEZs as well, it's important to think about what kind of industrial activity is going to take place in them. One of the key models used by the US uh, group, uh, Metropolitan Agency for Planning, is one that we always try to introduce to clients, and that is, that is called the location quotient. So it looks at the potential for industry sectors to grow in, over the coming years, but also to look at their employment uh, potential. I remember working in uh, SEZ development in Turkey, where they were looking at uh, using SEZ infrastructure to grow um, cut flowers. And yes, it, the location quotient wasn't coming out very positive. Whereas when they switched to other things like uh, renewable materials, construction materials, other forms of industrial activity, it really showed that the, that sector has a much better chance to add value in, into the local economy. Those industries or sector focus with the highest location quotients 
These are the ones that often are the tradable clusters, the tradable industry clusters, the ones that can actually uh, be traded across borders. And that, of course, meets so many of the, the government's national economic uh, and fiscal priorities. This slide here, I won't go into it, but we uh, include it and you'll see it in the recording if you're interested. We look at how an SEZ can be competitive, first of all, and secondly, how it can develop a strong sectoral base given that global competitiveness position. And these two combinations, the attractiveness of the SEZ to attract investors and then the potential of that sector to add real value. I think the, these are two very important uh, dynamics in SEZ success in the long term. I have here a kind of very uh, simplified model of doing the initial research and analysis in order to produce the options, the red, uh, the red zone there, the strategic options for an SEZ, and then finally um, moving on to develop the strategy and the actual investor and business cases. So it's a standard model for this kind of FDI infrastructure driven uh, investment. So that's just a quick look at SEZ, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from our experts about not only SEZs in Nigeria, but also how the national and the state economic promoters and the, the Economic Promotion Zones Authority, NEPSA, are going to work together to bring the benefits. But I wanted to conclude with a couple of slides on uh, the excitement, but also the challenges and or maybe even the threats of what we now, I think we can all assume we are in, which is the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, this is a, a very interesting notion that we are now very much uh, adopting uh, increasingly rapidly uh, technologies, uh, solutions, services, products, which have that benefit of bringing uh, big data, computer, uh, smart intelligent computer systems and applying it to um, products and services designed by humans, but not necessarily with a, a huge amount of human uh, direct involvement. Uh, so there are challenges, but if one has that vision going forward of creating a strong knowledge economy uh, in any, any part of the world, then it actually creates a very exciting prospect. We know what uh, disruptive technologies are. These are technologies which have emerged following the power of uh, increasing power of com computing and automation, intelligence systems. And as a result, they don't just increase the pace of, of uh, technical development, they actually totally disrupt it. And I, I wanted to highlight a few examples, the ones that I think are perhaps the most obvious or maybe not so obvious, but certainly interesting. The first here is a kind of collation of consumer applications of uh, disruptive technology. We're all aware of the way Uber has transformed its sector dramatically. Linked to Uber, we can also see drones, drone technologies, unmanned uh, aerial vehicles of various sorts, shapes and sizes are also beginning to shape the way we live our lives. And I think we need to bear that in mind when promoting, you know, Nigeria for SEZ development, that there must be some kind of technology, uh, future technology insights. Certainly drone technologies and agribusiness, agriculture is very much linked to it. Uh, a few other examples, uh, 3D printing. And I don't just mean in the manufacturing sense, but it's also now being applied even in the healthcare and life sciences, in surgery. Um, 3D printing technologies is going to uh, increasingly change the way uh, manufacturers go about their business of producing goods. Not necessarily in the production line, but especially in the prototyping and the early phases uh, and uh, product development phases of production. Another key area of disruptive technology, which actually you might think it's nothing to do with manufacturing, but it very much is. And that is the so-called blockchain technologies. Well, we need a whole day to discuss blockchain. It's more than just uh, cryptocurrency, but it's certainly the future for business and for us as consumers in the way that we manage many, many transactions, both financial and uh, business. Uh, we can manage our logistics, uh, our stock movements, uh, even the products we buy in the future will be uh, coded with a blockchain that we'll be able to assess for the whole life of that product or service. So blockchain technology is another key area. Linked to the second one I mentioned, 
regenerative medicine. Um, uh, I know that Nigeria has some great plans for developing an even stronger healthcare sector. I think a key component of that will be to look at technologies such as um, regenerative medicine and become a, an important leader. Uh, finally, I wanted to talk about the Internet of Things. Every sphere of our business and, the, and our, even our daily life is now involved with sensors and devices, it, almost remotely without even knowing they're there. They are connected together via the Internet uh, or maybe other micro-Internet technologies to provide really smart manufacturing or business solutions. So the Internet of Things is growing apace, as you can see in the chart at the bottom left it's growing at an exponential rate and it's going to have uh, a big effect for us. So finally, the implications at a government level is to look at the industrial sectors that you want to attract, but also make sure that they are future-proof. Make sure that they are not just smart ideas that you can adapt today, but that they will be sustainable and developable in the future and that they will address competitive challenges for those uh, activities in the long term. Also make sure as you are doing in Nigeria to provide the best physical infrastructure possible. That may sound obvious. The second and third items I think are, are fairly clear. I think the third one in particular, Nigeria is a big market in Africa, but it still needs to find niches for it to be successful in the, in the Nigerian economy, African economy, and in the global economy. So it's not just enough to say, agro-processing agro or uh, construction or food processing, it's going to require careful monitoring of specific niche opportunities. And the, the final things I would say, if you're working at the state level, is from an economic promotion point of view, I think other than two or three of Nigeria's states, most of the states are not well known internationally. That uh, branding and promotion needs to be, so that journey has to start. Similarly, economic development has always been a challenge in many developing countries. It, time is needed to coordinate the economic development efforts, the very good work of national and local and private sector and other stakeholders, and to con constantly try to work together to get the daily grind uh, done correctly. And whatever you do in promotional terms, it needs to stand out internationally. So it's not, this, it's not good enough just to be a, a me too in this business. When, if we're going to compete with the best of Asia and the rest of the world, it's got to be distinctive and successful. And finally, yes, government is going to do a lot, but ultimately the best economies have done well by empowering their private sector somehow. So even when it comes to SEZs, try and find ways, colleagues, to find outlets for the private sector to take on these initiatives. Thank you very much. I hope that you followed me for most of that. And I pass back to you, Charles. Thank you. Very happy to introduce our eminent professor, Adesoji Adesugba, Managing Director and Chief Executive of Nigeria Export Processing Zones Authority. Uh, Prof, thank you very much for joining us and we pass the floor to you, sir. Thank you, John. Let me, first of all, thank you for having me um, to speak about the special economic zones prospects in Nigeria. Let me start with a quote from the president himself, Mohamed Buhari. And uh, what he said is um, one major strategy is to accelerate the implementation of the Nigerian Industrial Revolution Plan, NIRP, through economic, special economic zones. The focus will be on priority sectors. And the main purpose is to generate jobs, to promote exports, to boost growth and upgrade skills to create 1.5 million jobs. I uh, will quickly introduce you to SCZs in Nigeria. This webinar is intended to introduce a special economic zone scheme in Nigeria. The opportunities are bound to attract both local and foreign direct investments. I'll just um, quickly tell you about what we have in Nigeria, uh, the opportunities as well as the challenges. I always like to approach um, speaking about my location from looking at the challenges and the opportunities that you can derive from those challenges and also how competitive we are but quickly let me just tell you that the federal government um, has identified the special economic zone scheme 
as a key policy instrument in the realization of the industrialization agenda. Following the visit of um, His Excellency President Muhammad Buhari um, to the People's Republic of China in 2016, the President was quite impressed at what he saw in, um, in China. And this is in the context of the experience and where the deployment of SCDs in 1980 propelled the GDP from $191 billion at that time to $11 trillion in 2016. A staggering increase of 5,764%. It's uh, easy to look at what China did, but it's also very important for us to note that if we are trying to replicate what they did, we must ensure that all the parameters are met, especially with things to do with infrastructural development, the regulatory framework, not just for the, um, for the authority, but also sister organizations. So there must be political will. And that's one thing that we will also discuss about. In April 2017, the president launched the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan, medium term national roadmap, aggregating the sectoral plans for agriculture, energy, transportation, industrialization, and social investment. So regarding industrialization under the ERGP, the Special Economic Zone model is being sought to accelerate implementation of the Nigerian Industrial Revolution Plan. This is a four-year roadmap on industrialization um, in order to create jobs and promote exports, which in turn will facilitate economic growth. Specifically, the plan sets out to increase the contribution of manufacturing from 4% of GDP to over 10% in the next five years, which translates to about 5 trillion Naira annually. But of course, uh, these were projections which were made pre-COVID-19. And as you all, you, as we all understand, um, a lot of things has happened to the global economic, uh, economic projections. And Nigeria is not left out. However, the development of special economic zones in Nigeria is still a presidential priority. And right now, we even believe it is one strategy that we can use to take Nigeria out of the doldrums of economic downturn. So quickly, um, the NUSA Act of 1992, um, Act number 63, created the Nigerian Export Processing Zones Authority, which is a federal government agency, and we are under the supervision of the Ministry of Trade. Uh, the goal then was to provide a conducive investment climate, by offering a competitive incentive regime, streamlined administrative procedures and world-class infrastructure. Um, it's very important for us to understand the context under which the Special Economic Zones operates in Nigeria. Its incentives, areas of business and opportunities, and future aspirations, which this presentation also seeks to highlight. Our NEBSA currently operates um, various types of free zones. We have the export processing zones. We have free trade zones. We have border free zones, science and industrial technology parks export processing zones and logistic free zones. So far, we have about 42 free zones that have been licensed. And uh, currently we have 22 um, operational. Um, within that, we have uh, 400 uh, free zone enterprises um, in different sectors. We have managed to attract over $16 billion um, we have G, we have Samsung, we have Dangote, and a couple of others. And local investments have been put at about 270 billion naira. We've generated over 15,000 direct and over 30,000 indirect jobs. And um, of course, we've generated government revenues in excess of 30 billion naira. We've carried out quite a number of pilot projects such as the fabrication of the Egina FPS project, 
and the Agbani oil field living quarters. Construction of the Dangote refinery at Lekki Free Trade Zone is the largest refinery in the world. It's due for completion by the first quarter of 2021. Uh, we do hope they'll be able to meet up the target because of the shutdown this year due to COVID-19 um, pandemic. I recall having this discussion yesterday about the challenges in the free zone, free zone system in Nigeria. And I'll just mention a few and then delve on the most critical one that I feel could act as um, a deterrence to investments of which we are working towards assiduously to ensure that we overcome such challenges. Uh, one of the challenges is the lack of understanding of the concept of the free trade zones by government agencies and other stakeholders. This is very critical. And I think this is one of the most critical challenges we're having. Um, I spend most of the time trying to have discussions with sister agencies and trying to make them understand um, that we are all on the same page in terms of economic development and the reason why governments had um, that voted free zones in Nigeria. So we have inconsistency, inconsistency in government policies. So you, sometimes it depends on who is, who is the head. So we have to be very close to all the stakeholders that have anything to do with um, the free zone as far as government is concerned. I, I believe we are working on a law. We need to give it a little bit more bite and make it easy for people to understand and get the buy-in of all the agencies that have anything to do with the free zone, both federal and state agencies. Of course, we know how much um, it is to have a power plant. For us to have um, a free zone of the national standard, we must have adequate infrastructure like power, water, um, internet services, and so on. Uh, it's quite, um, if, you, if you don't have adequate funding, you cannot provide this. And um, But fortunately for us now, I think um, we have a leading government and the president is in the forefront for the development of the free zones that we have, especially public free zones. Our management, where we are in the process of upgrading, retraining and skilling um, people that manage our free zones. And um, that is going on well. Uh, we are spending quite a huge amount of money in doing this. The current NEBSA management, however, has a renewed focus to support these zones in the resolution of these challenges to ensure improved efficiency in zone operations. Okay, uh, let me just quickly mention something um, about this coronavirus period. Nigeria, in Nigeria, we've been lucky so far. I call it luck, even though we've recorded quite a number of deaths. Um, we are not sure why there are so many recoveries. We're, we're waiting for scientific explanation because the world had thought that people will be dropping dead on the streets of Nigeria. Currently, as of today, we have had 59,738 um, cases, out of which 51,000 founder and three recovered. And we've had um, a little bit over a thousand deaths, 1,113 unfortunate deaths uh, compared to what we were having in the United States of America with over 200,000 deaths. Um, um, but then also we have to put this in context of um, um, Nigeria and other African countries having over the years um, having problems with con contagious diseases like malaria, death from malaria is almost 100,000 um, annually, and death from um, tuberculosis is said to be in, in about 250,000, and those are World Bank, um, the World Health Organization statistics. And we also have deaths from um, um, HIV AIDS, also nearing over 200,000. So that's why I said we may count ourselves lucky um, in terms of what has happened with the coronavirus uh, situation in Nigeria. Having said that, Nigeria was not isolated at all from the pandemic. 
we had a global shutdown for transportation and that was um, very that has disorganized world um, the economy including nigeria but here we had to take some steps the nigerian government followed um, what other countries were doing and released the nigerian economy sustainability plan which was a um, response to the COVID-19 pandemic. It, uh, create, this was created to address the health and economic emergencies caused by the pandemic through the granting of a number of incentives. Government also rolled out measures, including the granting of various stimulus packages for the resuscitation of businesses, particularly to the private sector and SMEs. In supporting Mr. President's agenda, NEPSA recently revised his strategic plan to include uh, an increase in the number of functional and optimal special economic zones as one of its key goals. There are several planned and ongoing strategies targeted at achieving this goal. One of the main strategies is the creation of special economic zone models of global best practice by establishing plug and play technically driven zones and providing an enabling environment for business in the following thematic areas. Medical, which is a flagship program, mining, technology, and agriculture. Medical is flagship, of course, because it's in direct response to what had happened during the COVID-19 pandemic, when nobody could travel for medical, um, for any medical reason. Um, you will all agree with me that that was a trend period for most people all over the world. And it's also brought to fall the opportunities that is in that sector. Um, for those hospitals that used to treat Nigerians, uh, they couldn't have people, uh, patients to treat. And for Nigerians, they couldn't travel abroad. So that is the, that's the reason why we thought that we should have a medical Zone. Nigeria spends about $1 billion every year annually on medical tourism. So our intention is to bring the hospitals here and to give them all the incentives as per their operating a free zone. Talking generally, um, four of our six, six approved special economic zones by Mr. President, Lekki Free Trade Zone in Lagos State, and then the Lawrence Special Economic Zone in Kwara State um, shall be developed into modern zones. We also have Funtua, Katsina, and Gombe uh, in uh, Gombe State. We'll be starting this quite strongly. Um, we hope to set up the Special Economic Zone for the medical tourism in Lagos. And we are going about this, uh, working with the World Bank IFC group, IFC, um, with the International Financial Cooperation of the World Bank Group. Yeah, so there's been have, recent have high have the expression just, of strong interest. Just like in five a, minutes to go, Prof. No problem. I'll, I have, I'll finish in five minutes. Okay. So we have um, serious, um, serious um, interest in uh, special economic zones in Nigeria. So the Lekki Free Trade Zone in Lagos State has been here marked as a site for the first fully equipped and functional medical special economic zone, like I've said. And this is um, ongoing, plans for this is ongoing. We are having discussions with Lagos State, and we are having discussions with the Federal Ministry of Health and other stakeholders in that sector. Now quickly just um, run over the incentives. Uh, the incentives, I'm sure Takuma will be also be talking about that. But uh, for the for the special economic zones, we have exclusion from all federal, state, and local government taxes. It's duty free importation on all goods. Um, it's a one stop approval for all permits, operating licenses, and incorporation documents. 100% foreign ownership of investments. 100% repatriation of capital profits and dividends. We are on all imports and export licenses. We are on all expatriate quotas for companies. Permission to sell 100% of your manufactured, assembled, and imported goods into the domestic market. 
and uh, of course, prohibition of strikes and lockouts during the first 10 years. We're, we're hoping to make this a permanent feature in our economic zones, in our new law. Rain-free land within the first six months of construction for government-owned free zones. So we have quite a number of opportunities. So you have a list of what you can do there, and of course, more that we can also negotiate. Nigeria remains uh, the top investment destination for green business with assurances of high returns on investments. The value chains of the world have been severely disrupted due to the economic dynamics. Um, the special economic zone community in Africa must continue to realize that working together is the best option for us post COVID-19. And it's time to look in works to leverage on the opportunities the AFCFTA offers to service the wide African market. Uh, we are also talking about the rules of origin as it affects us in West Africa. Nigeria believes that uh, we must allow uh, goods from our special economic zones to be allowed in the CFTA. West Africa is the only part of Africa that does not agree on this. But we believe that uh, the ECOWAS should uh, refocus their attention in leveraging on the CFTA through the special economic zones. We are focused to see that the special economic zone landscape in Nigeria dramatically change and expand over the next three years through the model special economic zones that we are promoting. The model special economic zones will showcase the potential benefits of special economic zones to Nigeria's industrialization again. Thank you so much for your kind attention. And I thank uh, John and Charles for also inviting me to speak. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Prof. I mean, we couldn't be hearing from anybody else on special economic zones than Professor Adesuba. He's a professor of investment promotion. So Nigeria has got it very right on this call with him heading the Nigeria, uh, you know, uh, special economic zone uh, uh, authorities. So thank you very much, Prof. Um, good you. afternoon, everybody. Um, John, Christina, thank you for inviting uh, me to um, speak to investment promotion and the special economic zones um, collaborating with the states. Um, I must say that uh, I am glad that you had Professor Adesuba to speak before me. Um, he's not only a professor in investment promotion, he was also my boss when he was uh, at the NIPC as a director before um, he left. And um, the good thing about this whole thing is he's spoken to quite a number of things that ideally I would speak to uh, as an investment promotion officer. So this is just the presentation outline. Um, I have four major areas that I want to speak to. Um, the overview, generally on investment promotion and the SEZs, and then the central role of investment policies within industrial policies. I'd like to speak to that, and then strengthening the SEZs. And then finally, I would like to talk about the challenges and opportunities. But this time around, more on the opportunities because Professor Adesuba has already spoken you know, uh, on the challenges. So uh, Nigeria's return to democracy in 1999 heralded significant and comprehensive microeconomic reforms, which revived the country's yearning for industrial growth through several policies. I've listed the policies here from the establishment of uh, Bank of Industry in 2000 uh, to the 2003 Nigeria Industrial Policy, uh, 2007 National Integrated Industrialization Development, uh, 2009 Industrial Park Development Strategy. Now, this is not limited to because we have more, but I just thought I should bring out these four because they are very prominent. So um, an overview on the SEZs. It's generally about, it's a cluster uh, concept continent, uh, strategy of industrial growth. 
and it was experienced in Nigeria with several phases, um, like um, the private sector as the engine of growth, while government um, facilitates and regulates investment. Um, this has been several severally used. The country had aspired to uh, promote indigenous um, entrepreneurship and um, utilize the venture capital financing strategy to drive industrial growth. In this light, there was a proliferation of SEZs, uh, industrial estates, free trade zones, and export processing zones in every nook and corner you know, of the country. So what is the central role of investment policy within the industrial policy? The key goals behind the establishment of SEZs are to encourage industries to develop in clusters, leading to economics of scale, skills sharing, and easier access by suppliers, to create industrial infrastructure to promote investment, whether local, whether domestic, or foreign, to promote cooperation between the public and the private sector, and to also use the zones as a launching pad for other plans to further development. So why do we, why create industrial infrastructure to provide investments? So every country or countries engage in attracting foreign direct investment. Nearly all countries does that because it has become a central component of the industrial policy in developed and the developing countries across the world. And that is the reason why the agency like ours, the Nigeria Investment Promotion Commission was established by the Nigerian Investment Promotion Act, chapter N117 laws of the Federation of Nigeria 2004 to encourage, promote and coordinate investments in the Nigerian economy. This act established the NIPC as an investment promotion agency of the government NIPC is responsible for registering foreign investments in Nigeria, as well as liaising between investors and government, institutional lenders, and other organizations concerned with investment. So SEZs and industrial estates play a huge role in the development strikes of several Asian countries, um, especially China, Malaysia, and Singapore as regards to job creation, foreign direct investment attraction, export growth and contribution to the GDP growth. In China, for instance, as of 2010, SEZs contributed to 22% of the national GDP, 60% of exports, 46% of foreign direct investment, and generated over 30 million jobs. This has made it more fashionable for developing countries, especially since the Washington Consensus reform era. SEZs are regarded as the most or the best mechanism with which developing countries could uh, selectively address conventional binding constraints. Uh, could be soft or hard infrastructure to firm growth in their quest to attract foreign investment. They also address issues of bad governance, corruption, poor trade logistics, and so on. On the flip side, they can also generate spillovers for emerging industries and private sector through technology transfer, as well as other sectors such as, such as services through residential areas, shopping malls, accounting firms, recreational centers, college services, and so on. Professor Adesuba had spoken to this. It's part of the new strategy that um, they're already uh, doing with the economic zones within the country. SEZs can help attract investments, create jobs and boost exports, like I have said earlier on. And that is the reason why NIPC sees SEZ itself um, as an opportunity to put um, the infrastructure development there shouldn't be left to government. The private sector can come in 
take that as an opportunity and put that um, uh, infrastructure in place so that the private sector can uh, work on. Such a thing has happened in Abuja uh, in between 2014, I think, to 2016, when there was the Land for Swap Act. So the NIPC promotes SEG, uh, uh, SEZs that are ready in order to facilitate rapid economic growth by leveraging tax incentives to attract foreign investments and to spark technological advantage. Um, Professor Adesuba had also listed out um, some of the incentives, you know, that are available for those that will be located um, within the uh, economic zones. So what do investors look for really in uh, picking uh, a place or location for investments? It could either be macro or it could be micro. Macro in the sense that, you know, it defines project assumptions and long list of location options. It analyzes the long list of candidate locations and then pull out a short list. And it looks at the workforce and the skills infrastructure cost also. So it evaluates the shortlist location and selects the preferred location. Um, site search and negotiations goes on after that before implementation. So if we have special economic zones that are well kitted and equipped, I mean, it is easier for the investor to locate that, you know, and then, um, relocate to that place or pick that place for uh, investment. NIPC has stakeholders that we worked with, but the one circled in red is the one that uh, the state's coordination department um, really concentrates on. So you can see part of our stakeholders is the private sector and the public sector and diplomats, but the state governments are the ones that the state coordination department actually work with. And the kind of support and uh, relationship we have um, includes domestic direct investments insights, proactive investment facilitation, coordinated investment promotion, and subnational investment uh, climate reforms. Coordinated investment promotion means the department actually works with the state investment promotion agencies to promote those states as designated, you know, location for investments. So this is um, about targeted um, promotion. Um, we uh, work also with the states and we work with our diplomats, especially if we have um, targeted um, sectors within the country. So we look at uh, the countries that have the best practice, and then we try to uh, identify the companies that work there and see how we can reach out to them. Um, it is not an easy task. This is something that you send many emails out, follow up with phone calls, um, the Nigerian ambassador or the DEX, you know, that is in charge of investment in that country, follow ups on the investor, to see if we can begin to uh, draw their attention to what we have available in Nigeria, you know, for them to come and um, invest in. Um, so I have listed a whole lot of things that goes on, you know, around the um, targeted uh, investment uh, promotion. It includes proactive investor facilitation, coordinated investor engagements with states, improvements in the subnational business environment, strategic relationship with target countries, strategic insight into states' competitive advantages, and sector focused strategies. So, this is one of the major things or support that we do um, for states, really. Um, it is called the Nigerian Investment Certification Program for States. Um, this is where we work with the state in developing their capacity to be able to put in place information, property, and marketing standards. The state's ability to provide competent, accurate, and relevant information to investors in a timely manner is what we have under the information standard. 
the state's ability to offer sites and buildings that meet targeted investors' need in a transparent and efficient manner is what we have under the uh, property standard. And the marketing standard is actually a combination of the first two. The state's ability to promote and sell the region in a focused manner and to offer professional level of service to potential and existing um, uh, investors. We have done this with many states now and um, it's a continuous uh, process. So uh, Mr. Adesuba actually listed or rather, I beg, you my, I beg your pardon, Professor Adesuba actually listed a whole list of um, incentives that can be gotten in uh, the special economic zones. So NIPC, in collaboration with Federal Inland Revenue Service, um, have put together a compendium of incentives. And the compendium, the compilation, yeah, it is the compilation of physical incentives in Nigerian tax laws and duly approved sector specific incentives. Uh, we have six principal sections, uh, which includes investment policies and protection, general tax based incentives, specific uh, sector specific incentives, tariff based incentives, export incentives, and the special economic zones incentives. Um, so you can see that the special economic zones actually have their own special incentives put together, which is also embedded in the compendium of um, uh, incentives. So um, Professor Adesuba actually spoke to the challenges um, that we have in Nigeria. So rather than I repeat um, what he has said in order to save time, I think it's better I speak to um, the reason why investors will still come to Nigeria to invest. We have a large growing population. We have abundant natural resources, resilient, hardworking, can do spirit with Nigerians, fast growing projections, private sector led economy, sophisticated financial market, an essential component of every African strategy abundant economic opportunities, two decades of political stability, improving business climates, young energetic entrepreneurial population, optimistic mobile population. I mean, the list goes on. And um, I believe that investors still come in, not because you know, um, of just this or because we go out and speak to them. Uh, it's simply because the country is really ready um, for investment, despite the major challenges that we have. And one of which we all know is the dependence on the oil sector, which accounts for 95% um, percent of the foreign currency income and 80% percent of the national budget. Professor Adesuba spoke to the inadequate infrastructure that we have. But of course, now we can have the private sector even come in to fund um, the uh, infrastructure. For example, I think it was last month that uh, the Federal Minister of um, Finance actually came out where uh, the private sector is now investing in Nigerian customs, you know, by bringing in um, a lot of um, revolutionary uh, uh, activities into it by bringing in the Internet of Things, like John has uh, spoken about. Um, I believe the Federal Ministry of uh, Industry is also in the process of trying to um, use the same Internet of Things, you know, to, to digitalize, you know, its um, activities. Um, I know that Niger state government have set up uh, the uh, Suleja Smart City. They've appointed the managing director and it's all about um, digitalization. So the list goes on. And um, despite all the challenges we have, I believe that Nigeria is already a destination. Um, SEZs are coming up uh, with a new managing director who is a total investment promoter with bringing a lot of new innovation into the activities of the uh, special economic zones. This is my last slide and um, I like to end uh, this whole uh, 
presentation uh, with just one thing. Nigerian government institutions needs to synergize more. And I am glad that the NEPSA uh, has a new managing director who would be working very closely with the Nigeria Investment Promotion uh, uh, Commission. And this, would, uh, this kind of synergy would make you know, uh, things really easy between the government agencies that are promoting investments into the country and the private sector that is trying to take advantage or leverage on whatever government has to provide. With this, I would like to thank everybody for listening to me and I'm available for any question. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Amino, for that very incisive uh, presentation. Uh, you know, with Amino and then Professor Deshuba, you know, you know, um, you know, holding key positions in the two major investment promotion agencies in Nigeria. I think Nigeria cannot go wrong. So thank you very much, uh, Amino. Uh, we will. Um, Take your questions and answers. I mean, the question and answer session is where we are now. So you can post your questions in the chat um, window at the bottom. Just click the chat and then you put in your question there. But if you wish to speak, um, that's fine. Uh, we can um, allow a few people to, to uh, pass a few comments. Then we move to the submission of the whole uh, thing. Hi, Ben Henderson. Ben Henderson, you want to um, you want to uh, make any comments? Uh, nothing from me, but thank you very much for the presentation. It was fantastic, uh, really insightful. Cheers. Okay, Ben Henderson, journal from the UK. Um, yeah, that's correct. Uh, who else? Uh, Alex. Uh, yeah, we are Alex, actually Alex from uh, Calgary, Canada. Okay. Um, thanks, for, yeah, yeah. thanks for some very incisive uh, presentation. Um, I, I, I live in Canada, but um, I'm a lover of uh, Kote country in Nigeria. Um, Those who hear all the, all the things that I've had to hear this morning, my own time. Um, my concern is the, um, my concern is with the image of Nigeria around the world. Um, if you don't if you don't have uh, FDI, if you don't have foreign direct investment, uh, what what um, what what what's the nation doing about its image around the world? Um, other African countries, you see Rwanda, uh, I follow Sokai a lot, and then you see visit Rwanda. You see conscious effort being made uh, by other nations to talk about the goods um, it, it's about the good and the things that are happening um, in their country and why you should visit um, either as a tourist or as an investor. Uh, nobody can tell our stories better than us. Others would only tell the, what the stories that are convenient to them. How are we putting the right image out there concerning the nation Nigeria and the opportunities that are there for people, not just um, uh, not just the natural resources and all of that, but that Nigeria and Nigerians are good people. Thank you very much. Can I uh, can I respond whilst people are thinking about your your challenging question, Alex? Um, I, obviously, I'm a, a UK national, and um, I think it's true to say that from my, in my uh, sphere of global influence. The vast majority of Nigerian uh, influence is um, is very positive, and um, you know what what Nigeria gives to the world culturally and as human beings is is uh, is very good. Um, but what we don't really know much about is Nigeria. Yeah, Charles unfortunately has disappeared. <laughs> He'll be back. <laughs> um, but Alex, what I think uh, is the case for Nigeria, you know, uh, we know it's um, in many ways the largest economy in Africa, but that's about where it stops. We don't really know more than its oil and gas um, 
we, we know some of the negative perceptions, but we don't know about the real power and potential of, of Nigeria. And uh, that's actually a, a challenge for many countries. It's not just Nigeria. I think many, many countries in Europe, Asia, and in Africa, Latin America is the same. So I think it needs to go hand in hand. And we can look at some of the really good examples of uh, countries and their IPAs and other, other organizations, their trade organizations, countries like Ireland, you know, um, perhaps in Asia, you know, country like Malaysia, Indonesia, constantly work on their image and identity. And I think Nigeria could do more about its economic and business ID, uh, whilst it's cultural, social, sporting, creative, and uh, even its diaspora, you know, is, is, is very much appreciated, at least where I, where I see it in Europe. Uh, now, the question raised by Alex on the image of Nigeria, I think John has um, dealt with it somewhat, but uh, we still have professor on the line, Professor Deshuba, perhaps he might have a, some word here to, um, you know, because like Alex said, it has to be a conscious pursuit. And John also agreed, we have to consciously work on a Nigerian image because what people hear from outside Nigeria, the more are the bad news, the Boko Haram and the rest, but every other country have these same issues. So Nigeria needs to do a lot in really focusing on image and then taking it to the next level so that the full benefits of all we are talking about here can be realized. Can the professor um, Adeshuba kindly, um, you know, uh, tell us something about that? I, I keep on asking people who talk about the image problem of Nigeria. Now, is it possible to have 200 million people in the world or anywhere and all the 200 million people are angels. Nobody is bad. It's not possible. It's not humanly possible. Uh, when it comes to the image, I agree with you, we need to do a lot more to our work. In terms of security, we are not as bad as the US, where you get a gunshot crisis every minute. In terms of security, we are not as bad as South Africa, where you can't walk really on the streets of Johannesburg. In terms of security, we're not as bad as Iraq, Iran. We're not that bad. We're not as bad as Afghanistan. We're not even up to what the level of what is happening in Libya and so many other countries. I think I, I, I feel safer working on the streets of Lagos than working somewhere in New York, downtown, even downtown. And um, we, yes, we need to talk more about why those of us who have also lived abroad and tasted both economies, maybe the US, uh, living now in Lagos. Of course, if it comes to security anywhere in the world, you know you have to be careful the places you go to. Don't go to the hotspots if you don't live there. So, and every time I take a flight from, from Petro and come to to Lagos, I always look at the business class, um, business class um, occupants, and you discover that virtually all of them are foreigners. If it's that bad in Nigeria, what are they coming to do in Nigeria? Um, it's not all that fantastic, like anywhere. Every country has its own challenges. We do have our challenges, but sometimes I always tell people that those challenges that you think we have are actually opportunities for us, you know, or for the investors. We talk about energy, we talk about infrastructure, we talk about what else? Those yeah. are opportunities that we see more and more foreign investors coming to Nigeria to help us, work with us to overcome those challenges. People with bright ideas. Nigerians are doing well too, internally. We have uh, people in technology now being um, acclaimed worldwide in Nigeria. It's not all roses, but it's not that bad too. And we look at the opportunities and the framework of um, leadership, um, which people always come yeah, about. Right, but yeah, I can yeah. assure you also that it's very important to note that 
every investor that's coming to Nigeria and thinking about about the market, Nigerians must definitely wear clothes. That's an opportunity. Nigerians must wear shoes. That's an opportunity. They must live in houses. That's an opportunity. So for us in Nigeria, all we need to do is make sure that continuously we get people that will make things happen. And we are doing it. And that's why I'm here. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Roland Oro. I'm very happy to be uh, on this session. Uh, and thank you so much for the uh, presenters uh, for your insightful presentation. Um, my comment is um, going to be on the need that, I mean, the, the fact that we need to look at, I mean, this is my comment. This is just my own personal opinion. And I think what Nigeria needs to do, first of all, is to look at the domestic investments or investors, right? Let's even forget foreigners for a while, all right? Let's look at uh, the, uh, ourselves, you know. Nigerians are not investing enough. Why is that so? We need to address that. And I think that three, three factors are required uh, for people to, uh, uh, you know, decide to deny themselves uh, of immediate pleasure to set aside money to invest, you know, for the future. So three things are necessary. One, faith. You have, you need to have faith in the system, in what you're doing. The other one is hope. And the third one is love. If these three factors are absent, people will not want to invest. And that's what we're seeing right now. We shouldn't be going out to want to get people in when we are not doing what we ought to do, all right? So there, I mean, we don't have the time now to look at all these issues, but I think we need to focus on domestic investment. And I think the NIPC has started some program along those lines in the last few years, uh, trying to engage with Nigerians, you know, they have wealthy families, you know, uh, they need to be directed, they need to be provided with insights, with information on areas where they can invest. And after that, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, foreigners, we see that Nigerians are investing, you know, are good and then they will come in you know uh there are issues infrastructure all of that these are all opportunities but i think for me i think we need to focus on uh limited uh, which is targeting uh domestic investors and mostly because of covid a lot of foreigners are shy right now they don't want to go out to start new projects so i think we need to focus on So uh, I, I'm going to stop there for now, uh, but I, I think I'm thank sitting- you, Thank you, Roland. Hold on just a minute, I'm sitting right now in the UAE, and, and I think also that in addition to that, we need to make use of our foreign embassies. Um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, they have a trade and investment department that should work with the other uh, agencies of government in terms of uh, you know promoting Nigeria uh, to the outside world. You know? So let me just stop there for, for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, so. thank you very much, Roland. Yeah, thank you, Roland. Thank you for the comment. Roland, where did you join us from? I'm joining from uh, the from the UAE. Uh, Charles, can I just uh, have a quick UAE. response to Roland? That's in Dubai. Yeah. Charles, can, 30 can seconds, I... bro. 30 seconds. Yes, yeah, just a quick one, Roland. Yes, we agree Nigerians should do more. Yes, go ahead, bro. Yeah. We seconds. agree Nigerians should do more in terms of investing in their country. We also agree that we should have an increase in the over $22 billion that comes into Nigeria from Nigerians in diaspora annually. We agree we need to do much more than that. Um, but let me quickly point out um, a, a major investment that by a Nigerian um, that people should should emulate in terms of uh, quantum, in terms of quality of the investment, and that's the uh, Aliko Dango refinery in the Lagos Free Zone, uh, which is an investment worth over $20 billion, the largest refinery in the world. Um, I think when I visited that place, I was very proud to be a Nigerian. We need more Nigerians to be very courageous to put their money where their mouth is. We are asking all Nigerians to go and see what Aliko is doing in the Lagos free zone. 20 billion, right. that's a huge amount of money. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Prof. I think just a few seconds for Aminu. Aminu wants to also weigh in. I think it's getting interesting, getting very interesting. Yeah, so, so thank you. Just, uh, 
Thank you, Charles, uh, for giving me the opportunity. Um, in line with just what Roland said, just yeah, seconds. so um, the NIPC, through the DDI policy, you know, has uh, developed a database of high net worth individuals that are already investing in Nigeria. One of such investment is the e-enforcement for the road use electronic um, traffic system. You are in Nigeria, you drive in Nigeria, you see how people beat the traffic light and the rest. So right now the VIO and the Federal Road Safety are working with this company and this company is a 100% Nigeria indigenous company. You know, uh, deployed all the resources in terms of hardware, in terms of software, you know, uh, using the internet of things to do things. So Nigerians are actually investing in Nigeria right now. You know, this okay. is what I feel I should- Maybe, uh, maybe we uh, just need to do more. Maybe we just need to do more. Okay, so everyone can see it, okay? Um, dear participants, uh, uh, presenters and everyone, thank you very much for uh, this uh, wonderful uh, session. Uh, to just sum up in uh, one minute, um, we've had it all from John to Professor Adishuba to Aminu and our contributors. You know, SCZs in Nigeria, we need strategic focus. So a lot more can be done working together. Now, the fourth industrial revolution, which is the disruptive technology, is taking over the entire world. Things we used to know uh, and do in volume is all now reduced to something more compact. And things are going on uh, around the world, and Nigeria must key in. Um, Nigeria needs to uh, a critical to create um, a development niches, development niches to be able to get the benefits of SEZs. And somebody said states are virtually unknown internationally. We need to work on that as well. States in Nigeria are virtually unknown, meaning that you know uh, every state must be out there because from GDP global, we work for states across the world. The state of Florida, Edmonton in uh, Canada, the state of uh, New York, you know, just states. South Africa, we have West Cape, East Cape. They are standing on their own and pushing things, you know? So we just have the coordination at the central level uh, of the government in those countries. So it is a challenge to the Nigerian states to get up and promote your states, just like Lagos State government is doing. Lagos State is doing very much in that regard. Policy consistency, Prof talked about that extensively, and we know that has been a problem, not only for economic development and um, special economic zones in all other areas. We need to bring it all together. And we're happy we have somebody like Professor Deshuba, who is hammering on this, and I believe he, everything he's doing at NEMSA will lead to uh, bringing down those barriers in policy inconsistency. Medical tourism incentives are everywhere. NIPC have come up with several incentives that would help investors mark Nigeria and actually come in and invest. Uh, we need more synergy among the states. And then somebody talked about faith, love, and hope. We thank you all very much. These are all salient points that we need to take in. The relevant agencies need to use. And let me also say, GDP Global is there to assist Nigeria, to work with NEBSA, to work with NIPC, to work with the Federal Ministry of Physical Trade and Investment, to work in all relevant, and to work with the states and have these things happen. We've done it for over, you know, uh, you know, 240 countries, I mean, over 200 and uh, over 95 countries around the world working on 240 projects. Okay, so we can assist in this regard. Now, um, in closing, let me just say that um, this is the second in this series of webinars. We're holding for Nigeria and zone. We are doing um, a similar thing in uh, Europe and also in the Caribbean region. 
do the two webinars. The next two webinars for this year will come December 3, November 5 and the And uh, we'll be focusing you know, on FDI promotion excellence. We do with structure, strategy, and campaigns for uh, you know, foreign direct investment. And when you talk of campaigns, then the image team, we need to come in also. We need to do something pointedly and very strategically about Nigeria's image so that things can continue to roll well. It remains for me to thank each and every one of you. Christina, do you want to say a few words before we close finally? Hello, yes, thank you very much, Charles. Uh, I would like to thank everybody, our speakers, our guest speakers, for, for taking part and taking your precious time. Thank you very much for that. And for all of you attending uh, and, and watch this space, we will be coming back soon, as uh, Charles said, and uh, rolling on more webinars, and hopefully you will like the content. Over to you, John or Charles. Thank you all very much. It's been very interesting to have this chance to immerse into Nigeria's economy and its uh, its future. So thank you all very much. Yes, John. Okay, as we said, as we uh, part of the message we sent out in the chat box, we sent the video, the entire video of this whole session with the email to all participants. So just give us a week or two, we have the complete video, you know, on your, on your screen. We'll send it to everyone by email. Don't forget GDP Global is the leading <laughs> economic promotion and, you know, uh, and, a, and a business development consultant. Great, Charles. We're losing you, Charles. Uh, around the world. We are here. We are into <laughs> races. So, you know, we, can, we are available to assist anybody in any country around the world. Yes, Thank you are. very much. See you at the next Thank webinar you. on 5th of November. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye, bye. bye everyone. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Aminu. Thank you. Thank you again, Aminu. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Adeshuba. And your whole team, Neka, uh, Kijani, was very helpful, very helpful in getting all this together. Uh, thanks to my friends, Aliyu Michido, Ruth Smith from London, uh, Moody in London, uh, Chigo also in London, uh, Ebere Chuku. Um, Abdurrahman, Bernadette, uh, Aisha.